Um, so I'm going to start in a couple of minutes after I know that the audio is working and stuff. Okay, so it seems to be working. Um, so to start with, there's a couple of logistical things. Um, if you have any comments, then you can use the chat bar on the side if you're on YouTube um, to post your comments. And I should see them in about 30 seconds. Um, and I'll do my best to address those um, at the end, but if there's something that's super simple to answer, I'll just answer it then. Um, but in general, it's sort of good to um, wait until the end, because I may um, talk about some more stuff later in the presentation. Um, so I noticed a couple of people just joined. Um, again, if you have any comments, use the YouTube comments and um, post the question, and I'll answer it um, at some point. So I'll just get started. Um, so obviously, this is the webinar on Siesta, which is our REST framework that we use at Vivid Cortex. Um, it's our sort of third iteration of web framework, and um, it's basically the result of a bunch of different ideas we've had um, based on the issues we had with the previous frameworks and a couple of new features that we wanted to add. So quick introduction to me. My name is Preetam Jinka. I work at Vivid Cortex on agents, APIs, anomaly detection, all kinds of stuff. Um, I study math at the U University of Virginia. And there's my um, contact information if you have any questions, um, either about this presentation or anything else that I do. So, um, Quick overview of Siesta. So it's an MIT licensed Go package. Um, you can just go get it uh, using this URL. So it's very minimal. Uh, that's the way we like to characterize Siesta. So it's minimal in that a lot of the functionality that you would expect from a web framework, um, a lot of that is moved into the application. So that makes it very flexible. We didn't want to be limited on what we could do in our API servers just because our framework didn't support it. So that's one thing that we learned from our previous frameworks, which um, sort of tried to do everything in the package itself. And because of that, it was very hard to add features. One of the reasons um, it's difficult because uh, so it's, it's difficult because if you, ha if you add an incompatible feature, you may end up changing the API or the usage or the behavior, and it gets very complicated to incorporate, incorporate those changes into the rest of your API servers that depend on this package. Um, so it, it's one of those things where um, we have a web framework that's very central to all of our API servers, and it's very hard to just change that and have everything just work. So one of the reasons why we wanted to move stuff into the application is because all of our applications are different. Um, they share a lot of the same characteristics, but ultimately, they're different applications. And we don't necessarily want uh, the same features to be applicable to all of them. So that's one of the, the reasons why we don't have any built-in middleware. Um, so we don't have anything to um, encode JSON responses, and um, you know we don't have any loggers that are built into the framework because um, you know maybe um, since it's an open source project, not everybody wants to use the middleware that we provide, and um, more importantly, we don't want to be locked in to a certain way 
um, to write responses, for example. So instead, we combined a bunch of small, useful features that work well together. So that's a lot like Go. Um, so if you've, um, if you've sort of watched a few talks about the design of Go, one of the key goals was to have a set of um, orthogonal features that work well together. So you're not limited by um, sort of things that don't really work together, that don't really allow you to do everything, but rather have simple features that work well together so that you can build whatever you want on top of them. So it, because of that, it might be unfair to compare Siesta to other frameworks. Um, so we had a discussion on Google Plus um, about Jin and sort of why Siesta is different. Um, so we try to keep this framework to be very minimal. Uh, so that's not necessarily the case for other frameworks. So you know, in terms of features, maybe Jin can do things that Siesta can't. OK, that makes sense because we're trying to be minimal. But on the other hand, it makes sense that Jin can do everything that Siesta can do. That's, you know, that's totally fine. Um, we're not trying to introduce features that aren't elsewhere. And we're not trying to um, uh, go in the other direction, where we get rid of as many features as possible and you know, sort of lose the point of the, the package. We wanted to just get to the bare essentials of what we need. Um, so the three features that um, we really needed were middleware, context type, and type parameters. I'm going to talk about um, why we wanted um, to have those features and how they work for us. So to begin with, um, I want to sort of talk about how we look at middleware conceptually. Um, and if you're not familiar with middleware, hopefully this gives you a good introduction to what it is and uh, why you need middleware. So imagine an extremely simplified example where you have a giant handler for each endpoint. Um, so I'm assuming that you're familiar with Go and NAND HTTP and all that stuff. So um, if you just look at the function signature here, um, you should know that it's just a handler function. So if you just have one giant handler for each endpoint, um, you're going to have a bunch of boilerplate uh, within each one of those handlers. Um, and this boilerplate can be for logging, authentication. Maybe you're um, checking request parameters, uh, getting database connections, all kinds of stuff. And then at the end, you have some more boilerplate to write your, your responses, um, and et cetera. But in the core of your handlers, you're going to have stuff that actually executes what the handler does uniquely, like adding a user, requesting a resource from a database, and stuff like that. So the issue with having giant monolithic handlers is that with many endpoints, you have lots of repeated code. You have things that are the same. They do the same things, but they're just repeated everywhere. So um, there's a one easy way to fix that. Um, and that's just to deduplicate. So we took all that boilerplate in this case and moved it into two separate functions. So we have HR handler, and then we introduced F and G that have the boilerplate. Now, again, this is pretty simplified. Um, of course, there's going to be some uh, parameters that you're going to be passing around, not just the response writer and the requests. Um, but this is sort of the summary of um, the first step to making um, handlers sort of uh, cleaner. So in this case, um, all of that duplicated code is now in um, F and G. So that takes care of most of the boilerplate. Um, all of that, you know, logging, authentication, 
response writing code is only in one place, but it's being invoked in all of your handlers. So all of your handlers still have to call f and g all the time. So um, now what's the next step? Well, you just move them out. So in this case, h becomes, um, it just contains our main handler code. It has no um, occurrences of f and g. There's no boilerplate. But the boilerplate is still in f and g, our uh, middleware functions. But you, now you need some way of making sure that those run before your main handler and after your main handler. So you need some other component to make sure that this chain of functions gets executed properly. And in Siesta, we call this a service. It's a set of handlers and routes. So you predefine your handlers, as usual, with any framework. Uh, but you also um, set some parameters for the um, middleware chaining. But we also need something else. So I mentioned you need to pass around some more parameters. Um, so that's where contexts come in. So contexts allow you to um, have a connection between middleware. So when you moved, uh, when you took a single function and broke it up into individual functions, um, you lost the connection between all that code. Um, they're not in the same scope, basically. Um, so contexts are the solution. They're the glue that allow middleware to work together. So in Siesta, we have a really simple context type. Um, so there's there are other packages out there that provide a context, but we wanted something that's um, a lot more simpler. So yes, we have a new type here, but on the other hand, we don't have any dependencies. And it's just a really simple type that you can substitute in um, you know, another implementation on your own. So it's an interface. Um, so in Siesta, context is an interface that has two methods, set and get. So set sets a key to an em empty interface value, and get retrieves that value, given a key. Um, so notice in our um, handler or function signature, we have this new um, parameter that takes the context. So this single context gets passed between all of our handlers. So um, a few examples of um, what you can do with a context. So you can set a request ID. Um, so whenever you get a request, you generate an ID, set it in the context, and then in all future handlers, you can use that ID to log any errors or um, uh, if uh, you have any exceptional circumstances, you can log it and make sure that you can trace back that request through all the handlers that you have. Another example is getting a database connection and passing that handle on to multiple middleware. So notice that our function signature no longer matches the HTTP handler func type. Okay, um, That's because we have the new parameter. So there is an alternative, which is to not pass around a context. Um, so that's something that. Uh, the Gorilla Context package does. So I'm going to briefly talk about why we don't do that, because um, that was a question that was asked a few months ago in one of our blog posts. So the alternative is the Gorilla Context package's approach, which is to use a package level context. Um, it's sort of the same thing. There's a get and um, you know, you can, you can set and get um, context variables. But in this case, it's, um, that state is held at the package level. So um, it also uses the request pointer as a key to get the request specific context. So this is kind of complicated because first, you need synchronization. There is a single map in the package level scope. So you need locks. You need to make sure that um, everything is synchronized, so you have valid state. Um, 
Second, it's prone to leaks because once a request ends, you may not delete that uh, request specific context in the um, package level context. So ultimately, it's a more complicated approach, and it's also slower. So we decided not to use that approach. To make things really simple and not slower, we just decided to uh, pass context around as an argument. So this is how um, we like to think about middleware. So we like the idea of middleware chains. And they're very straightforward, no pun intended. So in Siesta, if you've read the documentation, um, we mentioned the use of middleware chains. And this diagram is to sort of help you visualize what we mean by chains. So a Siesta service has two predefined chains, a pre-chain and a post-chain. So these chains run before and after your main handler, respectively. So um, suppose you have a route. Maybe it's um, get users. So you have one function that runs uh, for that route specifically. But then before and after all of your handlers, uh, all of your routes, maybe you have some common um, middleware that you want to run for all of them. So basically, the pre-chain executes for all of the handlers, and so does the post-chain. Um, but it's only that the route-specific handlers um, that get executed differently, if that makes sense. Um, essentially, the pre-chain runs before all of your routes, and then the post-chain runs after all of your routes. Um, and we also have this quit function path that makes it a little easier to bypass certain handlers and middleware in order to implement some more com complicated behavior. So, because this is all abstract, I'm just going to replace the text with some uh, middleware names, so like request ID or auth. Um, so this is actually what our API servers look like. Uh, they're basically all structured exactly like this. So if we have an API server that creates a user, um, first we have a bunch of common pre-middleware that, for example, generates and sets a request ID in the context that does some authentication, so checking the user tokens, accessing the database, and getting token-specific resources. Um, and then we have the actual handler that creates a user, for example. And after that, um, if we create a user, we get the user object and set it in the context, and then return that back to the user as JSON. So we need a response writer. And there may be some miscellaneous things after that. So the reason why we have the quit function is because, um, for example, if the authentication fails, we don't want the database access uh, middleware to run, because that assumes that it's being given a valid token, for example. So, if the authentication fails, then we can't provide a valid token. And if we can't do that, then we can't get a valid user um, or valid uh, environment details, for example, from the database. So um, in that case, we'll just quit early, make sure that the database access middleware doesn't run, make sure we don't create a new user because we have an invalid token and then um, go straight to the response writer. So the way that the quit function paths work is the first handler in each chain always runs, but future handlers may not run because um, the previous handler quit. So um, basically, request ID always runs, response writer always runs but they can invoke the quit function and prevent the future handlers from running. So we guarantee that we always get a request ID. We guarantee that we always generate a response. Um, 
but we may not always um, authenticate, have database access, or uh, execute the main handler. So the other interesting thing that we like to do is compose middleware. So we like composing handlers to create more handlers. Um, for example, the create user handler may need to decode a JSON payload in the request body uh, if this is a post or a put. So if somebody wants to create a user, they send us a JSON um, object representing that user, and then we um, insert it into the database and then return what we just inserted. But um, that create user middleware, or sorry, handler, may actually just be two handlers composed together. So in this case, we could have a read request body middleware function. And then another function that actually inserts um, the user into the database. And as with the pre and post chains, we can still have the same quit function behavior. Um, so if we don't get a valid user payload, we'll just quit early and then jump straight to the response writer and um, not have the main insert user function run at all. So what do we get in the end? Well, each function that is represented by a box is only implemented once. And the rest of the hierarchy, all of the chaining behavior, uh, mainly happens in the application. So as a benefit, you can sort of arrange these in any way you want, and you can get some pretty complicated um, execution behavior, and that's not really limited by the framework. So that's pretty cool um, because it gives us a lot of flexibility. And the, the chain implementation may sound complicated, but its implementation is really quite simple. There's no magic. So there's literally just a slice of handler functions, and we just go through them one by one, making sure that if one of them invoked the quit function, we quit early. And, that, and this is exactly what we have in the code right now. Um, it's really simple. So the next thing I want to talk about is typed parameters. Um, this is one of the features that was brought over from our previous frameworks. So note that this is a completely orthogonal feature. You don't have to use it, and it's not a necessary part of the package, but it's just something that um, helps us write our API servers and write um, safe code that handles all kinds of request parameters. So this works with route parameters and query string parameters in the same way. So for example, if you define a route um, which is resources slash and then a resource ID and then um, something else like things or whatever. Uh, and you also have a query string parameter called all. Maybe this gets um, either some of the resources um, or the things for a resource or all of them. Maybe they're deleted and you still want to see the deleted ones. Um, well, we can do all kinds of um, checks and stuff by treating all these parameters as um, specific types. So we don't have any string parsing in the actual handler itself. The um, parameters um, types uh, sort of de do that for us. And so it's a lot like the flags package. So that's, that's a really convenient feature. Um, it's not, again, it's not a, a, something that's required. You don't have to use it. We just include it because um, it's something that we use everywhere. So this is sort of how we um, use it in the code. You basically make a new siesta.params object. Um, then you define your parameters and their types. It's just like the flags package. And then um, we 
set all of the route parameters um, as strings in the request form. And again, you can parse it if there is an error parsing it because they are typed. You can return the error, um, set an invalid request response, um, do whatever. And then later, you know, if it's a valid um, parameter, you can actually check to make sure that the um, resource ID, for example, is valid and so on. So the next thing that I want to talk about, um, which isn't necessarily specific to Siesta, it's just um, it ties in really well. It's something that I don't think is mentioned in many places, but it is a a very essential part of the way we build our API servers. And you know, surprisingly enough, you know, most people may not like testing, but I think um, personally this is my favorite part just because of the way we do it. Um, so because we're able to split everything up, again, this is not specific to CSA. It's more of a, a benefit of having middleware because because you can split everything up into separate functions, we just made everything a lot more testable. So for example, you can test your authentication code separately and your database access code separately. Um, writing your responses, you can do that separately. Everything is testable. Um, so I guess the more middleware you have, the more testable it gets. Um, so that's a benefit of having middleware. And testing middleware, um, depending on how you do it, it becomes really straightforward. So in Siesta, most of our middleware only acts on the context parameter. And the reason we do that is to isolate any side effects to the context itself for testability. So in our tests, we can construct contexts with a variety of parameters and run the handlers to test their individual behaviors. So basically, after the handler runs, we check the context again to make sure that we have the correct changes. So in this case, we have a, a really simple middleware function that converts um, response and or error data passed through the context into a structured response. So maybe you have a certain format that all of your responses are in, and you want to make sure that if you have an error, it goes into the response struct. If you have some data, it goes into the uh, response object, um, if you have JSON, um, into the uh, data field. So in this case, it's really easy to test this because you can take the context, you can set either the data or error keys, um, and then run the handler. And then afterwards, you can check the context again to make sure that the response key is set to the correct, um, correct value. So this is how we structure our handlers. So we make a new CS to context. Uh, we set some other specific values in the context, run the function, um, passing in the context that we made. Um, and we like to use a mock response writer. Obviously, you can make your own. And then for the HTTP request, we set the form values. Um, so maybe in this case, the, the handler is for a route that um, has an ID as a uh, URL parameter. So we can set those. And then at the end, we can look at the context again and make sure that we got the right response back. So it's really easy. So not all side effects can be limited to the context, especially when you're working with a database. And all of our API servers basically um, work with the database. So they do lots of crazy things like inserting rows and all that stuff. But we still want to make sure that it's all testable. So again, um, our handlers read 
modify right into the database, have side effects that we can't control because they're happening in MySQL. Um, the handlers also use transactions. So how do we make it testable? Well, the magic is to use transactions. Um, so this works for us because we use MySQL and it supports transactions. If you have MongoDB, it might not necessarily be the case. So this is how we use transactions for testing. So we run each test within its own transaction. So this gives each test a snapshot of the database. So when we run a test, it gets its own snapshot. It can do whatever changes it needs to, like inserting, updating, and deleting rows. And then we make sure that our handlers have their correct behavior. Um, so if a handler has to insert a row into the database, we can run it and then check the database again and make sure that the row shows up. So we let the handlers make their changes, and then we test the changes at the end. And when the test finishes, or if there's an error, um, we basically roll back any changes so that we go back to the original state. So the benefit here is that tests don't affect each other. So if you have, um, if you're inserting a user, you can run that test over and over again. And it always runs because all the changes have to be rolled back at the end. Another benefit to using transactions is because they are isolated, we can run these tests in parallel. Um, the caveat is to make sure that your isolation settings make sense. If you're using um, read uncommitted or something, then obviously that, that won't give you the same guarantees. So um, make sure you check your isolation settings in your transactions. But overall, if you use something like serializable, you get really nice snapshot behavior. And it really helps with testing. So the problems we have with um, running the handlers in transactions is that we need to be able to use SQL.db and SQL.tx interchangeably. But um, we can't just use a, you know, a SQL transaction for, our, for all of our handlers because not all of them need to run within a transaction. Um, and for those, we only run them in a transaction for tests. On the other hand, SQL DB and SQL TX are distinct types, so we can't use them interchangeably on their own. So the solution is to wrap them both with an interface. Um, so this allows us to switch between the two uh, during deployment and testing, respectively. So this is how we do it. So we have um, our own SQL DB interface that has um, all the usual methods like query, query row, exec, begin, rollback, commit. And we also have interfaces for um, the SQL rows. And in the implementation, we have our own DB struct that wraps um, a SQL DB or a SQL TX. And uh, whenever we have a function like query run, we check to make sure that we have a transaction. And if we do, we go ahead and run the query in the transaction. Otherwise, we just run the query uh, normally. So the benefit here is we can run all of our tests within the transaction because we set the transaction uh, value. Otherwise, we run everything in um, uh, the normal database connection. Um, and we also do some tricky things where um, if a handler has to run in a transaction, then it can call begin, and we set the the TX field um, for that transaction. And if a handler needs to um, start a transaction and we have to test it within the transaction, then begin and um, commit basically don't do anything. So we sort of pretend to create transactions um, within tests if the handler actually has to make a transaction. So 
it's a little bit of boilerplate, but um, the benefit here is that we actually expose the context to our queries as well. So basically, if you have a request ID, for example, um, you can actually do things like add a SQL comment and insert in the request ID so that whenever you have a query, um, the query text will always have the request ID. So if you use something like Vivid Cortex um, and you see SQL samples, you can actually um, identify specific requests that made um, or that executed that query, and you can trace them back in your logs or something. That's pretty convenient. So the last thing that I want to talk about is self-documentation. Um, it's not really a feature, but it's just demonstrating what's possible um, with Siesta. So uh, here's some example output. Um, so this is coming from the authentication example. So if you go into the Siesta repository, we have a few examples that you can look at. Um, so the authentication example is probably the most complex one. Um, so you can look at this and look at the example requests and look through the codes to see how this works. But essentially, we have a route that returns a resource given an ID and a user token. So um, if you run the request normally, you get the correct response. However, um, if you pass in a query string parameter like usage, it actually responds with all the parameters it needs to run that function um, or run that route, basically. So in this case, we have the name of the parameter, a type, and a description. So um, this feature is kind of um, rough at this point. Uh, for example, like the the parameter name is repeated, but it just it's just an example of what you can do um, when you have the flexibility like our framework does. So to do that, uh, I mentioned that it's in the authentication example, but I have a pull request that you can see. Um, so here's the the diff. So in this case, I have a new parameter that um, checks to see if um, the usage is requested. Now, there's kind of a, um, a, a chicken and egg sort of situation here. Um, so I mentioned that the um, parameters are typed. So to get the usage normally, um, you know, if you were to check the usage flag um, normally with the parameters as usual, um, it would tell you what the parameters are and tell you the usage and the type. But what if, for example, you didn't know the type, right? If you didn't know that the um, the uh, the one here is supposed to be an integer. Um, maybe you thought it was a string or something, and you called the, and you uh, request that URL. Maybe instead of a one here, you have an A. You'll have an error because um, it would fail to parse, and you um, can't see the usage. So let me go ahead and switch to my terminal. Um, to give you an example of what I mean. All right. So um, let me go ahead and build this and run it. I'm going to go ahead and, whoops. Go ahead and curl this. Um, 
This has a token-based authentication. So now we get um, correct results. So if I use the usage flag, I get the usage. Um, so there's that. But what if I didn't know that this one was supposed to be an integer? If I put in A, for example, um, this still works because of the uh, change I have. But if I go back and um, edit this, so here, if I change what's in here, get rid of this. And run it. So we get this error. Um, get bad parameter, resource, and we get the actual error. It says A is invalid syntax because we defined it as an integer. Um, but if you wanted to get the usage and didn't know what the type was, um, this is not going to help you at all. So we can't actually use the usage um, flag in um, the normal parameter parsing itself. We have to sort of have this ugly hack to make sure that it still works. Um, but once you do, we get that. Um, so this tells us what the parameter name is, what the type is, and the description. So basically, for all of our API endpoints, you can just um, add in um, usage, and then it tells you how to use that endpoint. So that's how self-documentation works. Um, but we're still working on it to make sure that it's um, even more useful. So let me go back into my uh, slides. OK. So again, this is how it works. Um, our parameters, you may notice that whenever you define a parameter, you have to give the usage. Um, so it's return value. Um, the usage function sort of um, has all of that usage strings. So ideally, I think what you would like to see is something like this. Um, so suppose you have some endpoint like this. You have resources, uh, resource ID, maybe um, some query flag like query string parameter um, called summary. Ideally, I think we would like to see documentation like um, what I pasted here. So the method, it's get, for example. And then for um, the URL structure, I think it would be nice to see all the different components, um, including which ones are parameters, and have the same thing for the query string parameters. And each of the parameters should have the name, um, the type, and a description. Um, and we should also include the, the full endpoint description. So I think this would be really useful because if you had a bunch of endpoints with um, different parameters, you can just um, request to see the documentation, and it would just tell you what each of those things are. And self-documentation, I think, is really important because it's a way of programmatically generating documentation. So you can imagine using something like this um, to generate documentation pages that are really easy to keep up to date because they would just get that information directly from the API. So you wouldn't even have to change any of the documentation you have for your APIs. You would just make your changes um, directly in your code, and the documentation would automatically update itself. Um, so that's basically all I have. Um, but I sort of wanted to go through the code a little bit to sort of explain a little bit more about how the self-documentation works.
So let me just expand my window a little bit. OK, so uh, one of the issues we have with self-documentation is um, it's actually not an issue with the framework itself. Um, so for example, uh, one of the neat things that you can do is define parameters in any endpoint um, and in any middleware. So uh, we actually do this. So if I show you the authentication example, so we have um, a single route here. But suppose I had something else like, um, Oops. All right. Service dot route and then get um, resource ID and then um, maybe something like features. And I also have a feature ID. So if I had something like this, I can do something interesting where I can have middleware to, um, you know, in one middleware function, I can just have a parameter to look at the resource ID. And then in another middleware function, I could have a parameter to look at the feature ID. So in code, um, you know, so suppose I have my handler here. It looks like this. I have that. And um, let's see. So suppose I have that, but I used compose. So this is a function that we provide to combine middleware functions together. So if I do the same thing, I do this. Okay, so this, this route is actually handled by composition. So we have two handlers that run in order to um, handle that route. So suppose I did this because um, the first handler has to look at the resource ID and maybe get some more information from the database. Um, in order to generate usage documentation for this, you have to check, you have to go through the entire chain of middleware and build up the usage documentation. Um, because there's no way for um, for your application or CS to, to know what all of the parameters of your um, of your endpoint is, um, all the parameters for your endpoint are, unless it actually goes through all of them, because these are sort of defined at runtime. So that's a limitation. Um, but it's not a limitation. It's a, it's a challenge that we have to deal with, but. It's not necessarily a, a CS limitation. Um, so, so we actually have techniques to handle this, um, but it's kind of too complicated for a webinar. So there, there probably will be a blog post to sort of explain how to do this. Um, besides that, it would also help to have documentation for all of the endpoints that you've defined. Um, and we actually have a pull request open to sort of help with that. So for example, we have uh, here a new function, um, a new method uh, for services to get all the routes. So what this information will give you is basically something we um, sort of already had in, um, well, so um, when you, call the service.route function, you have to give it 
um, you have to give each route a usage string. So we were sort of using that feature, but it wasn't actually being kept anywhere. Um, there's no way of retrieving it. So we're adding a new function here to sort of uh, walk through all the requests or uh, routes and build up um, a structure to give you sort of um, all of your routes and the methods so that you could um, generate a list of all of your endpoints. And um, I don't have a demo for you now, but what you can do with that is once you have all your routes, you can go ahead and go through all of your middleware and all of your um, handlers for each route and sort of build up um, this sort of documentation for every route. So in the end, you could generate you know, a, an object like this for every single route and document your entire API in JSON, um, all programmatically. You wouldn't have to do anything else. So that's um, sort of what's on the roadmap. Again, it's not a, a crazy complicated feature, and it's not even something that we're building into the framework itself. It's sort of a demonstration of what's possible just because we, we provided the, um, the right primitives. Um, so we have you know, very few things to add um, to the framework itself. There are a bunch of things that we need to clean up, but again, um, because it's so simple, we can make those changes without um, changing any of our existing systems, and things will just work really easily. So um, that's basically the end. Again, my contact information is right here. If you have any questions, I don't see any comments um, or questions on the YouTube page. Um, but if you have any specific ones, you can send me an email. Otherwise, you can contact me on Twitter. Uh, this is an open source project, so you can go ahead and open an issue if you have a question, too. And um, yeah, that's basically it. So thanks for watching.